is kind of just confused on this one minute only to make an uh, announcement that I need to make the judgment uh, for the schedule since uh, the schedule for spring semester um, for our class is final on uh, April the 30th, not, not um, May the 5th. So um, uh, this is a day for our final. You have only 27 uh, written response out of 27 you hand for me 25. Yeah, so that you can get 50 points. Okay. Instead of 28 at the beginning, I have not checked. Uh, before I didn't check the schedule. I know it's in the schedule. So again, please, if you do the presentation, please remember this date. Okay, Wednesday. Who, who does the presentation? Please. And then this month. So what's changing here? Um, final paper and presentation on... Are going to be due on the 30th instead? Yeah, 30th instead of uh, May the 5th, because okay. we should check the final exam. And out um, 27, you hand me 25, so that you get 50 points. Okay, so we won't do number 28? No, okay. this is the last one. Okay. This is 28. Let's move on. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay. What do you have? Uh, yeah. Um. Sorry. I'm just doing a walk. So. That's okay. <laughs> um. I had uh, Zen in India. Um. And. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the heart of Zen is uh, Satori. Uh, it's an awakening or enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It uh, it is the awakening to the true potential face. So it's the ultimate reality of it all. Uh, when the heart comes to life, it blossoms in compassion for all beings. Um, which is uh, I couldn't say their names. Uh, Nina and. Karuna, Karuna um, enlightenment and compassion, those are the names for them, are the essence of Zen in a way that two faces of one realization. Um, Zen meditation is also a therapeutic component and it helps stimulate the healing and the completeness of the whole person, the spirit and mind. It supports liberation. I couldn't really find, uh, I found about like where it started. Okay. Um, in India, but it, I really couldn't find a whole bunch. It just said it started in India, and um, they I forget who came over. At, uh, uh, they brought it over from India to China, and then from there it went to Japan and became known as Zen or Zena. In Korea, it's known as Sun. Um, but it started out as Zen Buddhism, and is now like its own separate sect from Buddhism itself. It's I've taken it's, it's evolved. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And let me stop for a moment. I'd like to introduce two guests here. Uh, our neighbors, they come down with us to do meditation every Friday morning from 10 to 11. Um, and what else? And Mark, too. Mark is our neighbor, too. <laughs> so you can sit down. It's okay. You can sit. Yeah. What do you have there? I also had issues finding anything very much about um, Zen Buddhism in India. And I did find that the Indian Dhyana, Dhyana Master Buddha Bharata was the founding abbot and patriarch of the Shaolin Temple. Oh, okay. And the Bodhidharma was the Buddhist Bikinu, traditionally credited as the founder of Zen Buddhism in China. And he was the 28th patriarch okay. in India. Yeah. This what we call it. Indian monk Atisa, holder of the mind tree of the teachings, is considered an indirect founder of the Gaelic school of Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah, okay. All right, that's all you find? Yeah. Okay, let me clarify to you. Um, the word Zen comes from Dhyana, the Sanskrit. Okay. And in Chinese, it's called Chan. 
in Japanese it's called Zen. It's a short one. We have Zen iPod, right? Uh, Zen music, or Kabi Zen, right? Uh, but the, the Japanese use the label. So the Yana is this is me by Chan, by Zen, or in, in, in the short form, meditation. Simple. Or mindfulness, and meditation in a different, different form of mindfulness. And it starts from whom? A Buddha. Remember? He sat under the Bodhi tree for four and a half days, right? That's, that's why he attained enlightenment. Due to his process of meditation, or it's a dhyana, or can I say that's all simple. Right? Um, and Throughout his lifetime, for 45 years of teaching, he focused his teaching, his teaching the practical teaching of meditation. Monks are not supposed to do meditation. And later on, when the Buddhism spread to China, Japan, and so forth, they have different ways how to tame the mind. Like, um, they sang Buddha names, they sang the mantra. But the main practice originally the Dhyana. Meditation. Um, so the other one is, is like the means or the. Um, it's many people they don't have patience to sit in meditation, so they decide the mantra, or if they have the faith, they decide what the names. That's what. But the point, the important uh, teaching of Buddha is meditation for the young. Is that clear? And this is a legend uh, in. Um, history is has not recorded yet, but according to legend, one day uh, while the Buddha was preaching or teaching, he he held a lot of flowers like they hold, uh, hold this paper in front of the assembly of monks and nuns, and they were there too. They don't they didn't know what he what he tried to talk, what he tried to say, what he tried what is meaning, but in the whole assembly, that's it, hundreds of thousands of them. Mahakeshiva, remember Mahakeshiva? The one who guarded the first Buddhist council, remember? The one still in Samadhi to wait for the next Buddha to come to pass the road and bows up the Buddhist authorities. So, his mouth, when the Buddha held that lot of flowers on his hand. You understand what's mean? Why? What did that monk smile. And other, later on, the Buddha said, Well, I have the treasuries of the Dharma eyes. Now, I pass to Makeshiva. You don't understand what's going on, right? He understood what was meant without any words. That's the point. Let's say, when, let's say, when you in love, right? With your boyfriend and girlfriends, any signal, right? Of him or her, you recognize that, right? Because you know his personality or her personality. Make sense? The third person couldn't know what's going on. Make sense? Without expression, orally, you know what she or he like to express. So there is the Buddha. So when he, he holds that flood of flowers, and this this Mahakishwa, he smiled. And Buddha said, well, I passed uh, my Dharma to him. Because you recognize my mind. Remember, we talk about what? How could he smile? When, when Buddha holy put the flowers, remember we talk about what? Remember that? Remember? Buddha nature, remember? Or pure nature. With that word, or intuition, with that word, with that express, expression, make sense? So that's what he recognized. He recognized why Buddha held the lot of flowers. You make sense? So that's according to the Zen tradition. That starts with Mahakishpa. Mahakishpa is considered as the first patriarch of Zen Buddhism in India. Well, actually, for, for a thousand years, from the time of the Buddha down to the 13th century, most of the monks and nuns, they practice meditation. Of course, later on, they use 
mantra or Risa Buddha names as a means to tame their minds. But that is, this is the most important teaching, practice, or techniques. Make sense now? Uh, so basically, it made you confused, right? When you talk about Zen, right? You, I, I think um, it's better if you can say that, oh, meditation in India, is that right? Much, much understandable, right? It's not for Buddha, that's so It's simple. So don't mess up. Okay, now, uh, and that comes from, let me see. Okay, so in according to the Zen tradition, there is 27, 27 patriarchs. In India, and Buddhist Dharma, Bodhidharma is the 28th one who told the story about uh, Bodhidharma. You guys learn anything about Bodhidharma? We talked about him the last time, right? Oh, not this one, sorry. Okay, here. Yeah. yeah, we talked about him briefly, right? Yes, sir. Wasn't he, uh, didn't he have a guy, um, a guy cut his arm off <gasps> to show loyalty? Not loyalty, sincerity. That's different. Loyalty is different. Okay. Sincerity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We talk about that, right? Um, so, this monk, he's a 28th patriarch, uh, according to Mahayana, according to the Zen traditions. He was a prince. Okay. You Kevin? No? Yeah. Are you Kevin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You ready to talk about him? Uh, sure. Go oh, ahead. Do it for you. <laughs> All right. Go um, <laughs> Yeah, you don't know. Well, they had multiple legends about him. Okay. That, especially about his origins, mm -hmm. where there were some that say he, some from Southeast Asia say that he was from uh, different parts of India, uh, mostly southern, but there's no distinct province. There's another legend that says he was the third son of a king. I forgot my laptop, so I can't pull my paper up. It's okay. From a, he was the third son of a king, and sorry, I wasn't expecting to walk into this. <laughs> we wait for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I found interesting is that he was depicted as having piercing blue eyes and an untamed beard, which is, mm -hmm. which is what made him stand out in mm -hmm. Asian culture because not, it's a very rare sight. Mm -hmm. He. Uh, he was to transmit the Dharma from India to China, and when he did, he was meet, met by uh, Yao Xin, if I remember correctly, who he who had a big celebration for him. Then he went and met the emperor, and him and the emperor had such disagreements and such troubles communicating that he went to a temple in the mountains and meditated to facing a wall for nine years. And when he was facing the wall, that's where a lot of the legends about him came up. Uh, according to one that I remember off the top of my head, he cut off his eyelids mm -hmm. because he was so angry with himself for falling asleep. Mm -hmm. And when he fell, and then when his eyelids hit the ground, they grew into tea plants, mm -hmm. and that started the tradition of students being allowed tea in order to help them stay awake and concentrate. Okay. That's, <laughs> what, that's what I remember off the top of my head. Okay. Anyone? Okay, so again, yeah, you see his, his eyebrows, right? it's fe look fearful, right? Um, so yes, he was a prince and he uh, left the palace to become a monk. And um, at that time, this was persecution in India. Uh, so his master, uprising, you guys go. You go to the west. The east, sorry, this is in China to spread the Dharma. If you stay here, you may be executed. So he he went by boat from southern India to southern China. And at that time, he met a Buddhist king or an emperor. Uh, I don't know whether I told you or not. This is the only this is the only Buddhist king that uh, became a monk. And later on, he asked his advice, uh, officers uh, to bring 
money and gold uh, to the, the temple so that they could get him back so many times. Remember I told you about that? Sorry. So anyway, so this, this emperor, he said, well, you know, I have to build hundreds of temples. I have thousands of monks known to practice. I print the sutra. I, I have done all kind of um, goodness for Buddhism. Do you have any merit? Remember I told you that story? Right? And, and this monk, he said, no. So he then told him. You know why? Why did he say no? You know why? OK, now here. Remember we studied about the cycle of rebirth, right? Right, remember? And the merits according to Buddhism. Yeah, the merit that we have all the people, we do Buddhism and so forth. Uh, it's help us only to, to have better life in human realm, in heaven. But we still revolve around here. So according to Buddhist view, according to him, it's no use. Why? Because as much as you go, you you do a good merit, you come to, you may be born in heaven or may be born as human as billionaire and so forth. But when you use up all merit, you have to work again. You see? So in his view, in this monk view, the important thing is to recognize your Buddha nature. That is the ultimate goal, to get out of the birth cycle to achieve to Buddhahood. That is the, the ultimate goal, not to revolve in this samsara. That's why he is then photo. You do good deed, but that's how good it is. Soon later, we'll be aspiring, and you have to do it again. And, and you we would go up and down in this cycle, that's all. And that's not a one legend. After that, the emperor could not um, keep him out of the palace. So what happened? He went. He, he, he left the palace, and there's a picture, an image. And on the way, let me see here, this one. OK, here. Look at this picture here on the left side. So on the way, going to the mountain, he, he needed to cross a river. So he, he saw a, a ferry, new ferry, right? He wanted to step on that ferry so that people could bring him to the other side of the river. But they didn't allow him to go. Because at first, he's a foreign monk. And second, he is look <laughs> differently <laughs> from, people, from common people. So they didn't allow him to, to get onto the, uh, the ferry. What happened? He picked up a branch. I couldn't legend. He picked up a, a branch of trees and stood there to, I guess, uh, to sail to the other shore. And from that time on, people looked at him in a surprised way. So he went to, remember which temple he, he went to? Remember? Was it 18? Remember Shaolin? So he went there. He went to this temple and sat there for nine years while he's facing the wall. He sat and faced the wall for nine years. And later on, people recognized him as a strand of um, uh, monks. So this monk, what is his name? Hui Ke. He heard about the fame of this um, Bodhidharma, so he went to seek for the teacher. Look, he knew, remember I told you, he knew on the snow for three days and nights. Remember when the snow is too cold out there, right? He knew there for three, three days and nights. What happened? When he turned around, he said, what, what are you doing over there? So, he, so this Hui Ke, he said, I seek a teaching from you. So he said, well, um, the effort of uh, kneeling down uh, on the snow for three days and now it's just nothing. So what happened? He went to the kitchen and got the knife and cut off his arm to show his sincerity. 
that they want to seek for the teaching. Of course, this, this is so extreme, right? You know, in, in the past, though, I have some kind of extreme way to do, right? In the East and the West, right? So anyway, from that time on, he taught this monk the word to Dharma. And this monk asked him, okay, master, can you calm my mind? You know, that's a, that's a question when you, when you want to do meditation, right? right? You, you like to calm your mind, right? Because your mind is so, tur is so uh, turbulent, right? So he's, he's asked the same question always. Master, can you calm my mind? And so the Dhamma, Dhamma, Bodhi Dhamma, he said, wow, that's okay. Bring your mind here. Bring my out. I will, I will calm your mind. And he looked around, he looked within himself for a while and said, I cannot find my mind. And Bodhi Dhamma said, I calm my mind. I calm your mind already. You understand that? You understand that? Do you understand that, that conversation? You follow my conversation? Follow my explanation? So, the, this monk, he asked, can you calm my mind? Right? So this, so Bodhi Dhamma said, bring your mind out, I will calm your mind for you. And this monk looked within himself, he said, I cannot find my mind. And so Bodhi Dhamma said, well, I calm your mind already. Make sense? Mm -hmm. What's me? Can you explain what's me? So, um, by searching for it, he calmed himself. Mm -hmm. And what else? You're almost there. What else? <laughs> more, more than that. Any, anything? Kevin, and we have any hint? Really, I think that it, by him searching in his mind for it, it took his mind off of the things that were on his mind. So it helped calm it because it gave it something else to focus on. I can say that's one way. Uh -huh. What else? What else? What happened with our total mind? What happened? Like uh, stress? He said, he said that he couldn't find his mind. Yeah, he said he couldn't find his mind. Not, not so much that it's not there, but like disconnecting the idea of the mind and the mistakes, but I'm just... Let's say, how about your stress, your anxiety? When you look at your stress or your anxiety, what happens with, with that kind of um, state of mind? For example, stress. Let's say you have stress um, right before taking the test, right? And after you have you taken the, after you have taken the test, you still have the stress. Yes or no, right? Sometimes, right? But my point is, I want to explain to you is that that type of stress before taking the test and after uh, finishing that test is the same same level of stress or is different? Before and after is that what you're asking? Uh, before and after. Same or different. Well, it depends on how well you do on the test too. Well, yeah, how you do on the test. So depends, right? So I mean, I mean, that's that's not equal, right? Mm -hmm. Not the same, right? So it may it may be severe. This may it may not be serious. And and it's, some of you do you have any stress whenever you walk into the room to take a test? I mean, what I know of you almost happened to you. Happened, right? Okay, you're not stressful when you write the test, right? Right. But the point is, uh, if you have a stress, even before, even not talking about the test, but let's say when you go to have an interview, so forth, right? It's when you deal with some important issue, the level of stress come up and down. Is that right? That is fluctuated, right? And this is, is impermanent. You understand that? It may come and go. The reason why he say, when he look back his mind, his turbulent mind, like our stress, he could not find it because it's come and go. Make sense? Because what? It's not real. Make sense? If it's real, it's, it will be there. Make sense? So that reason why I put it in my say, I calm your mind already. Because you recognize, he recognize his stress is, is illusion. Make sense? You recognize your stress is illusion or real? Mm -hmm. Real, right? Yeah. If it's real, it will last forever. But because it's come and go, I come with this view. It's the illusion. It's, a, it's not real. So if you attach to that, 
oh, I have a stress, you burn yourself out, right? But if you say, oh, yeah, because I have to deal with this kind of important issue, so yes, I have some kind of level of stresses, but after that, that's okay, I can come back to my happiness, state of mind. Make sense? All right, so that's why he said he calmed his mind already. Make sense now? Are you clear? Okay, so when you look at, now, whichever things, uh, where whatever mental state of mind you have, right, that stress and that and so forth, they come and go, is that right? But how about, let me say, let me give you one more example, from morning until night, again, the stress level, if you have, right, it may come and go, it may up and down, right? And because it's impermanent, but how about your calmness and peacefulness? Calmness and peacefulness. If you remain, if you, re, if you keep that stress level, you burn yourself, is that right? You kill yourself too. Right? Maybe people, they cannot handle that kind of stress, anxiety, depression. That's why they, they harm themselves. But what about calmness and peacefulness? If you can maintain from morning to night, you have that type of happiness. Is that right? That is the Buddha nature there. That's what he said is calm your mind there. Make sense? That is in Buddhist view. That's our pure nature. It won't, it won't it last forever. Make sense now? So whenever you deal with stress or anxiety, you remember it's they are illusion. If you, if you remind yourself that, you you may transform that stress level much easy. You take things much easy way. Make sense now? Right? Okay. So let me come back here. So after that, he yeah he transmitted the um, basically the Dharma to Haika, and um, of course the time for him to pass uh, oh, pass uh, away. But uh, there's one man. He came back. He he went. Oh, we see, and we're on the way, come back. He's, he's a Bodhidharma. Ho, ho, uh, let me sh show you these pictures. This image here. Um, okay, look at this one. This is, this is, this is, this is, this okay. is, not clear. There's many images about you. Actually, this one, this one here. Here. Actually, this one doesn't have the uh, issue. So, according to the man who saw him, even they they build him up to the ground, but later on he. On the way back um, from OEC, he, he passed by, he, he, he encountered Buddha Dharma. And on the way, somehow he carried a stick, right? A star. And actually, this one doesn't have a little bit fine. On the, at the end of this star, he's carried one shoe. Usually, we, we wear two sh to a, pair, a pair of shoes, right? But he carried only one shoe. What's mean? Who knows what's mean by the meaning of one shoe? Remember? Any idea? No? Remember? Our mind, I told you, right? Our mind always luxuriates it between duality, right? Like, dislike, attachment, anger, good, bad, and so forth, right? See? That's why we wear, of course, we wear two shoes. We wear two shoes. That, that's the meaning of, of duality. The reason why he carry on one shoe, we represent what? Oneness of Buddha nature. Go beyond attachment of duality. Good, bad, life is like. Remember, that is the meaning of meditation. Remember I told you? Right? Go beyond the judgmental thinking, analytical thinking. Good, bad, life is and so forth. If we go beyond that, we be sad. We be we have that type of peacefulness and calmness here. So that's one legend. Now legend is uh, um, many 
uh, especially many um, Kung Fu masters, uh, even now, uh, like Alex Shaolin Temple, they hook, they link him to them. Why? Because he's famous. According to their tradition in China, there's no, his, he, he doesn't, he didn't teach the monks Kung Fu, but somehow I don't know where, when this, the legend starts. So they link him as a master of Kung Fu too. You understand that? You know, it's, it's normal, right? Sometimes people want to be famous, so that uh, be famous. That reason why they, they link themselves to the famous people, right? This this common sense is normal. Okay, so that's just, that's just about the, his legend hmm. and uh, about the tea. If you do the presentation, please remember this date. Okay, Wednesday. Who, who does the presentation? Um, final paper and presentation on are going to be due on the 30th instead. Yeah, 30 instead of uh, May the 5th because okay. we should check the final exam. And um, after 27, you have to meet 25, so that to get 50 points. Okay, so we won't do number 28. No, okay. this is the last one. Okay. This is 28. Let's move on. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay. What do you have? Taking it's, it's evolved. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, let me stop for a moment. I'd like to introduce two guests here. Uh, our neighbors. They come down with us to do meditation every Friday morning from 10 to 11. Um, and Mark too, my is down there too. <laughs> so you can sit down, it's okay, you can sit down. What do you have there? I also had issues finding anything very much about um, Zen Buddhism in India. And okay. I did find that the Indian Diana, Diana Master Buddha yeah. Arada was the founding abbot and patriarch of the Shaolin Temple. Oh, okay. And the Bodhidharma was the Buddhist Bikinu traditionally credited as the founder of Zen Buddhism in China, and he was the 28th. Sorry, I was doing a walk, so. That's okay. <laughs> um, I had uh, Zen in India, um, and yeah, go ahead. Uh, the heart of Zen is uh, Satori, uh, it's an awakening or enlightenment. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it is the awakening to the true potential face, so it's the ultimate reality of it all. Uh, when the heart comes to life, it blossoms in compassion for all beings, um, which is, uh, I couldn't say their names, uh, Trilina and Karuna, Karuna, um, enlightenment and compassion, those are the names for them, are the essence of Zen in a way that two faces of one realization. Um, Zen meditation is also a therapeutic component and it helps stimulate the healing and the completeness of the whole person, the spirit and mind. It supports liberation. I couldn't really find, I found about like where it started. Okay. Um, in India, but it, I really couldn't find a whole bunch. It just said it started in India, and um, they I forget who came over. At, uh, uh, they brought it over from India to China, and then from there it went to Japan and became known as Zen or Zena. In Korea, it's known as Sun. Um, but it started out as Zen Buddhism and is now like its own separate sect from Buddhism itself. It's I'd like to use um, this one minute only to make an uh, announcement that I need to make the judgment uh, for the schedule since uh, the schedule for student semester um, for our class is final on uh, April the 30th, not, not um, May the 5th. So, um, 
this is a day from our final. And, um, and you have only 27 uh, written response. Out of 27, you hand for me 25. Uh, so that you can get 50 points. Okay. Instead of 28 at the beginning, I have not checked. Uh, before I didn't check the schedule. I know it's in the schedule, so again, please.